And uh, I just remind you that you have uh, 40 minutes for the presentation. OK, <clears throat> thank you, Marco, and uh, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, 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 on behalf of FSC, I want to uh, thank you all for taking the time out of your day to uh, take in our uh, presentation here and discussion, and we hope you find it interesting. We'll have some time at the end for some questions and anything uh, uh, that you want to get into in a deeper dive. Uh, we can uh, schedule a time uh, later on to uh, uh, to get into that as well. Uh, the title of this presentation is Concrete Reinforcing Reinvented. And this has been in development really over the last five, six years. And uh, it's uh, we found some uh, additional uh, applications for it, in, uh, starting from pipes. The, what you see in the middle of the picture there is, is a pipe, concrete pipe that's uh, very thin wall, but it's been wound with our technology that we'll describe later. And since we've been working on that, it's uh, all kinds of other uh, applications have, uh, have popped up, uh, uh, all having to do with uh, really with starting with uh, precast concrete in some fashion. You see blocks, you see sleepers there, um, you see some bridge segments. Uh, in the lower right corner, there's uh, some interesting things going on with uh, with uh, hyperloop tubes, where normally these would be constructed in steel, but uh, uh, we're part of a uh, consortium in Italy that's going to build 10 kilometers uh, north of Venice. Uh, it's called the Veneto Hyperloop Project. Uh, a large international contractor we build has a contract, and we're consulting with them on the uh, on the construction of the two. And energy storage, uh, you see in the lower left corner, <clears throat> is also something that's just kind of uh, uh, what we've gotten involved in some activity on. Uh, uh, these are all early stage applications, but the things in particular, the sleepers, the pipes, uh, the concrete blocks are, are really uh, market ready uh, products for us right now. Okay, can we go on to the next slide? So the agenda here is uh, one was we're going to discuss uh, to start off with why move away from steel. What are the what are the things that uh, are holding uh, concrete back, so to speak, uh, by using steel embedded inside the concrete as a, as a reinforcement technique? Um, and then we're going to discuss uh, some applications and really focus on the railway applications. Uh, the two that we're going to talk about today are sleepers and and uh, and what we call 4CP pipes. Uh, but certainly, uh, uh, we've done some work with poles, uh, but not as far along as what the sleepers and the pipes are. And then, of course, uh, there's some technology for railway bridges that are that are uh, not kind of going to come down the line in uh, in some number of years yet. Okay. Next slide, please. So I move away. <clears throat> Steel really is the Achilles heel of, of concrete, um, and particularly using it in our current practice of reinforcing concrete elements you know, for structural applications. You see here a, a very uh, corroded and uh, degraded bridge uh, 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 section. And and this is especially true for elements that are constant uh, exposure to the outdoor environment, uh, which is, uh, you know, absolutely includes things like sleepers and and, uh, and catenary poles. And steel and the big issue is steel easily corrodes if it's exposed to air and moisture and uh, to get at the, uh, uh, you get those two things working on the steel and, and you're going to have uh, this kind of result. And, and as many of you probably know, when steel starts to rust, uh, the rust actually is uh, exp expands. So uh, it doesn't take much before uh, that steel overcomes the very limited tensile strength that uh, concrete has and just pops it off and exposes it. And then, and then you're off to the races on the corrosion issue because now you've got direct exposure to, uh, to air and water. Next slide. So the long-term life cycle for steel reinforced, and there are uh, steel reinforced structures that have performed very well, um, 
One is you need a high pH environment uh, surrounding the, the steel and ordinary Portland cement uh, provides that uh, that protection that what they call passivity layer that forms around the steel, at least initially. Uh, okay. And also providing uh, depths of cover uh, over the steel is, is the standard practice and, and it's really absolutely necessary. One is you have to have enough grip, so to speak, to to uh, between the steel and concrete because the, the transfer of tensile stresses between the two are, are, are the transfer mechanism here is by shear. So you've got to have enough meat uh, of the concrete to, uh, to be able to accomplish that. And then also you need to keep air and water away from the steel. And there's an old saying in, uh, in the concrete world that there's only really two kinds of concrete, concrete that's, that's not cracked and concrete that's going to crack. Or concrete is cracked and concrete that's going to crack. So. Uh, yeah, even any kind of concrete eventually is going to develop some micro cracks, and that's enough to uh, start providing pathways for, for air and water. Okay. So when you, uh, uh, the top is a, a typical beam section, uh, like we see in the, the bridge picture as before there. So you have a, a supported beam on each end, and you have a load, and the load, of course, uh, is uh, highest in the center there, and uh, you have a moment at the bottom. So the steel reinforcement is always the, the attempt is always to try and place the steel reinforcement closest to that to that uh, that uh, outside surface, which is receiving the uh, uh, the moment from the tensile uh, from the load that's occurring. So it's always a game of how close do you can you get the steel to. To, to make the, the most effective and the, the most cost effective reinforcement scheme and still uh, protect the steel. But it's uh, that's where the cracks are going to form is where uh, where the moment, uh, the area of greatest moment is. A uh, railway tie is kind of a beam, but it has a different support uh, uh, structure than, than a, uh, a beam like in the top picture because it's uh, uh, it's laid on the ground and, and um, supported along the bottom surface entirely. And then the wheel loadings uh, created are a little different than you see uh, in, the, in a typical structural beam. So you have the two concentrated wheel loads, which of course produce a moment at the bottom uh, underneath that um, uh, where the wheel loads are. And then, but it also uh, induces a moment on the top surface in the middle of the tie. And uh, you can see on the right side, uh, the, that moment manifesting itself in significant cracking uh, right in the center of the tie. Uh, this picture on the right was taken uh, at the uh, MXV, which used to be known as a as a transportation technology center in Pueblo, Colorado, which is the um, R and D uh, and uh, and testing laboratory for the American Association of Railroads. And uh, they have a test track there where uh, all new ties uh, uh, designs are, are tested, but you can see the uh, this phenomenon of having a, uh, a moment a moment in the center there on the surface and creating the superficial cracks, which of course allows uh, water and, and air to get eventually down to the reinforcing steel. Okay. So embedding the steel in the concrete has these four key issues. Uh, one is again the the location of maximum tensile force in the in the in the structural object are, uh, end up being at the outer at the outer surface. The highest force is at the outer surface, and so the the more cover you provide uh, to try and protect the steel, the greater steel area you required. So. You, you start building in more costs than than you really need to, except you're trying to protect this, protect the steel in the long term. A concrete also goes through a natural carbonation over time, and it starts to lose that high pH. So over time, the pH is going to decline, and it's going to reduce the effectiveness of that passivity layer. And as we mentioned before, concrete naturally has some porosity to it. 
and will eventually develop some cracks and allow uh, water and air to penetrate below the surface. Okay. Another issue with uh, with uh, steel and, and also we'll talk a little bit about cement as well is they have high carbon footprints. Steel has a uh, carbon footprint of just short of two kilograms CO2 per kilogram of steel and cement is about half of that. Uh, but concrete uh, is, the, is the most used material on earth except for water and, re and reinforced concrete accounts, steel reinforced concrete accounts for about 80% of all uh, concrete uh, that's produced in the world. And it's such a, an important uh, construction material uh, uh, due to a lot of factors that it's not going anywhere, but uh, in, in today's world, uh, there's the, the environmental consciousness and the need to reduce the carbon footprint of everything. It's very important that uh, ways be found to uh, cut down the carbon footprint of steel reinforced concrete. So it's a high priority to meet the needs uh, we have as society. <clears throat> so there's a number of ways we can we can do that, reduce that footprint. One, we can use alternate reinforcing materials, uh, which is what uh, what we've uh, proposed here uh, and researched. Another is by use of low carbon binders. Uh, these have been around for decades, actually, um, and uh, but they have but they have a neutral pH. So now you don't even start with any passivity layer for the steel. So really, that's a, uh, even though these have been around for many years, they've just not been a big uptake of them because there's, quite frankly, a big risk factor with uh, starting the structure with no passivity layer uh, by that high pH environment. And it's not a, a great option for um, anything, certainly anything exposed to the outdoor environment. And the other option, uh, the other thing you can do is uh, simply use less cement per cubic meter. And we'll talk about that. That has to do with the production methodology uh, that you employ to build uh, uh, elements like sleepers. So for the reasons that we've seen above, uh, steel reinforcement is not the optimal material or to provide the flexural strength and tensile strength that you need for on a long-term basis. And you, you, you don't have to go any farther than uh, Marco's home country of Italy to find evidence that uh, concrete itself is, can be an extremely long-lasting material. Uh, the Romans used uh, concrete extensively. Uh, the Parthenon in Rome, which sits right next to a saltwater sea, and is in a very high seismic environment, is still standing after 2,000 years. It's still the world's largest uh, unreinforced concrete dome. And it's in very good shape, a beautiful building. Uh, it's evidence that concrete can be a very long lasting material, but mixing it up with steel, um, uh, there's, there's lots of issues that you got to worry about uh, on a, if you're expecting things to last for hundreds of years. So we've, uh, We've worked on this for quite a while, as I mentioned, and we find a very cost effective alternative. Uh, and we'll show, show you some applications for the, the real world. Okay. So we focused here more on uh, uh, simplified to things here. Uh, the reinforcement is provided through wrapping intention of an FRP roving on the element exterior. Now, while we are also, uh, uh, we tension the FRP, and then we also, uh, after it's been tensioned, and but before it's wound on the product, uh, we um, we impregnate that roving with with a small amount of resin, which acts, uh, which does a number of things for helping uh, distribute the load amongst the individual fibers. But it, it's at the end when it's done, it does not provide any, uh, it's not involved in the structural reinforcement of the material, which which is a drawback of pultruded um, bars, uh, FRP bars. 
Okay, we can move on. Again, as I mentioned, uh, fiber roving uh, is, is wound under tension and it's impregnated with resin just before the, the roving is applied to the material, but after it's been tensioned. So we get so we eliminate the resin as part of the uh, structural matrix. And it's wrapped around the concrete product and applies a post compression. So this is very similar to what's done with uh, pre-stressed steel. Um, there are a lot of large diameter water pipes, uh, both in Europe and North America, uh, that are that have a uh, uh, that are built using a uh, uh, pre-stressing wire wrapped around the outside of the of the uh, concrete pipe to provide the necessary strength. And in fact, we've uh, we're working with a, a large company in Portugal that's that produces these pipes, and we're winding. Uh, we wound some pipes for them for uh, pressure testing. They'd like to get rid of the uh, pre-stress uh, wire on the outside of their of their pipes, just because of some of the issues that that we've seen here with with steel. This post compression imparts flexural strength, uh, in addition to providing the uh, resisting the tensile forces. And this, this flexural strength is a really a unique uh, product. Uh, we'll talk about it some more, uh, but um, it's uh, quite impressive the amount of flexural strength that's that's derived from uh, applying uh, the FRP in this uh, technique. And you can customize the reinforcement scheme uh, because the number of wrapping laps uh, determines the amount of compression and flexural strength that you're going to derive and provide to the concrete. So you have the ability, and we've tested enough testing on this that uh, uh, we know we have the calculation uh, software to be able to determine uh, uh, and design the reinforcement to, to fit the uh, particular application. Okay. So railway sleepers. And we're going to see if this video will run here. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of a bandwidth issue here, but um, as you can see here, what what, you, what we're doing here is we're uh, um, Rotating the element and rotating the tie or the sleeper here and then winding it in tension. So, um, but you, this, this will give you the idea here of, and this is not the sleeper, our final sleeper design uh, that FSC is going to uh, uh, produce and, and bring to the MXV for testing. This is a sleeper that was provided to us by BTE. Uh, it's a precast company in the, in the Netherlands uh, and the largest, uh, excuse me, largest supplier to the Dutch National Railway of Railway Sleepers. They're quite, uh, they're quite interested in this technology and they, they provided us some uh, samples that we could do some testing on for them and uh, for their evaluation. Okay. So uh, the the properties of this the, these uh, these rovings or these uh, FRP materials uh, like glass and basalt, and what you see here in the picture that we're on the uh, right uh, that's basalt because it's a dark color. Um, they have tensile unit tensile strengths four to six times that of steel. So they're uh, they're capable of carrying uh, higher uh, loads than uh, than steel is. Uh, they have uh, excellent corrosion resistance, uh, and basalt uh, also uh, has uh, natural UV resistance. And basalt actually is is a very uh, common. Uh, it's one of the most common rocks on the on the Earth's crust, and it's a very simple, uh, uh, very inert. Rodican is excellent. Uh, the fibers and the rovings that come out of the salt are, are just excellent for these, especially these outdoor applications. They have higher fire resistance, um, like 
the salt is, is not combustible and, and its surface temperature is more than double that of steel. They have uh, uh, more flexural strength than steel because they got a lower mo uh, Young's modulus, which actually, once you tension this, uh, becomes an advantage and helps deliver that flexural strength to the to the to the concrete element. So it's uh, um, it's a nice little combination there. The 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 uh, modulus of uh, basalt is uh, closer to concrete than steel is, and so it, uh, by winding it in tension, uh, we not only resist the tensile forces, but we also deliver a, a flexural capacity that that's. Yeah, unachievable by any other uh, uh, method. Uh, by winding in tension also, uh, that eliminates the creep factor. So uh, we've, we've done these tests and the, there's absolutely zero creep uh, with products wound in, in this manner. The cost is lower and so is, uh, and it helps lower the CO2 footprint. So uh, the FRP, uh, is less expensive and is a material and the winding and it uh, produces uh, pretty much a 30% CO2 footprint savings just by taking the steel out and putting in the uh, uh, using the FRP. And it also uh, the issue with concrete cracks are no longer a problem now because uh, there is no steel inside to protect so. Um, it's, uh, it, it checks a lot of boxes here as, a, as an excellent reinforcing material. We've got a little video here that show you uh, a bit about what the the um, flexural strength that uh, you achieve. So this is a, a 200 millimeter diameter uh, inside diameter concrete pipe with a 11 millimeter wall that's been wound with the basalt uh, roving. And you can see it deflects, it takes some visible deflection, doesn't crack, and immediately rebounds back to its original shape. So um, it's a, uh, <clears throat> uh, the, when we showed this video to the people at the MXV in the, in Pueblo, Colorado, the engineers there immediately dubbed it flexible concrete. But it's a very important part uh, uh, property for a lot of applications, especially in, in rail ties because of the kind of loadings that they that they get. Now, uh, the other thing that that uh, this innovation brings is uh, we can now cast ties uh, uh, without steel reinforcing, and we can use the dry cast production method for, uh, uh, or immediate stripping, as some people call it, for producing the ties. Then once the ties are produced, uh, then then the tie is post compressed by by this technique we described of wrapping under tension. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, a dry cast tie cures very quickly, uh, achieves, uh, it's, achieves much higher strength the next day than you get with wet cast. And so it's, it's a very, it allows itself to be a very uh, high produ uh, produced in a high production environment. We're gonna get into, we're gonna discuss that a little bit for those who maybe not be familiar with dry cast concrete. Uh, it's the most common method worldwide for the production of high volume uh, precast concrete elements. And you see on the left side there a picture of pavers. Um, in the lower left, it's concrete pipes. And uh, in the center there, uh, uh, architectural block sections. Uh, these are all made with uh, dry cast concrete uh, and exposed to the, to the elements. Uh, on, the, on the right side, this is pre-stressed hollow core uh, that's produced in the dry cast uh, method, and uh, you can see it here being used in a in a parking garage. So it's it's uh, uh, whether you whether you know about dry cast or not, but we're going to talk a little bit about about it here just so you understand. Uh, the uh, first thing that characterizes it is in the upper right corner low water cement ratios. So this process uses 25% less cement to achieve the same strength as you get with wet cast. 
And the stiffness of the mix allows the form to be immediately stripped and concrete reintroduced to the mold, vibrated and consolidated, and then moved on again. So on the lower left picture there, these are concrete blocks coming out of a out of a really a fairly simple block machine. And on the right side of the picture there, the, just to show you and demonstrate the stiffness that they have, these are uh, these are uh, hog and cattle slats that go in the barns of, uh, um, of those kind of uh, agricultural farms. And they, the height tolerance is very critical on these uh, due to the fact they don't want them uh, height tolerances for the animals whose aren't uh, tripping and, and, and getting uh, cut by it. And here the, the sections are being stacked, uh, immediate stripping, fresh on fresh on top of, with only a plywood section in between and the bottom uh, bottom uh, slat still maintains its uh, its high tolerance. That's how stiff this uh, material is coming out of, a, out of the dry cast process. Okay. And you can see here you can uh, you can make pipes. Uh, almost all concrete pipes are are made by uh, dry cast anywhere in the world. Uh, so you can see you can strip the product that stands by itself on the floor, and you can return the the form uh, to the production station in this case to uh, produce another product. Again, it's a very very common uh, for high. Uh, volume production of, of uh, concrete elements. This is a little video there. They're, uh, uh, they're making some just round um, uh, blocks. So there's no reinforcement in these. So this is a, just showing this is an auto, a fairly automated system of filling. Uh, and then there's a variant, the all of dry cast production process feature uh, uh, very intense vibration systems to, to get a, a very stiff mix uh, to flow and, and fill the mold properly. So, and although we might have to skip this uh, video here, um, it's just not enough. It's not clipping along fast enough here. But uh, characteristics of dry cast concrete, you have a rapid increase in the compressive strength, and which allows you to be able to post compress it uh, the very next day. Um, you have very uh, reduced shrinkage and creep and it has excellent performance in uh, in the freeze thaw environment uh, due to a uh, low permeability. Okay, next. Again, the the uh, some of the advantages of of this kind of a factory is uh, you can have uh, one mold. You can make multiple ties at one at one casting. Uh, the other thing is, is it's all it's not necessarily a tie dedicated facility like uh, pre-stressed concrete ties are now. They're very, very specialized um, factories that are very expensive, and the only thing you can make in them is is, uh, is uh, pre-stressed concrete ties. And uh, so the whole investment, the whole cost structure is changed from a wet cast environment, uh, one mold, one one tie. Uh, to multiple ties out of the same mold uh, in a much less expensive environment, much faster. Uh, the productivity goes up, and and uh, again that adds to reducing the cost overall of the tie for the and the Fran Franey element. 
Here's the uh, so a structural behavior uh, little uh, test that we did. Uh, our R and D facility in in Italy is uh, is is uh, we have a very uh, large lab there that uh, one of the owners of FSC uh, uh, operates and uh, has uh, graciously allowed FSC to use that uh, uh, to do all the uh, all this R and D and testing. Uh, but we took a tie that uh, the dimensions are on the upper right there. It's basically uh, uh, the fundamental dimensions of a wood tie. And we kind of wanted to make a comparison uh, of what we could get out of that kind of uh, geometry uh, co compared exactly to a, a wood tie. And what, what you can see here is a, uh, the displacement and, and flexural strength that you, uh, you can reachable by the current concrete tie. Um, and the red line across there is the rail seat positive moment required by network rail and easily exceeds it by uh, uh, by more than double. Uh, and once you travel, you start traveling up that, that curve of the blue line and you get past the red line and then you reduce the load, you'll, you'll just be able to keep doing that uh, all day long. It'll, it'll, uh, It'll have some displacement there. It'll flex. It'll take the load and then go right back to its original shape, much like much like what a wood tie does uh, in the field. So CO two footprint savings uh, uh, is about uh, fifty percent versus pre stressed concrete ties uh, because one we're using twenty five percent less concrete or cement. I mean. Uh, there's additional binder savings uh, by using uh, low carbon footprint binders because we're no longer concerned about uh, protecting steel. And by using FRP and a small amount of resin uh, uh, also saves uh, a significant amount of uh, CO2 footprint uh, as compared to the steel reinforcement. Okay. So the benefit we're going to have longer life cycle uh, uh, is because we don't have any corrosion of, of uh, to, to contend with. Uh, and it's easy to produce low volumes of custom shaped sleepers and uh, the ties are going to have no conductivity because there's no steel inside for, for any kind of phantom currents. Uh, this, this technique also provides an increased level of dampening uh, which is also important to the to the rail industry, as compared to a, a rigid uh, uh, pre-stressed concrete tie. Again, uh, cracks are not a problem. Uh, we don't have an issue with relaxation losses, and there's going to be a, a significant cost savings and a significant carbon footprint savings to this uh, a tie produced in this in this manner. Okay. We're currently uh, we're currently finalizing all the design details uh, for our uh, the new uh, FSC tie in preparation to enter the MXV testing protocols. But we have uh, our lab in Italy has all the uh, testing equipment we need to fully test it before we send the ties to Pueblo, Colorado. We're already going to know what the results of the testing is going to be because uh, we have the we have that ability to to fully test it before sending it uh, into the into their protocol. Okay, we're just going to discuss for a couple minutes here four uh, uh, CP pipes, uh, and we call that uh, circumferentially compressed composite concrete pipes. This is where this this uh, technology uh, started and evolved from. It was. Uh, it was done, uh, it was started to try and tackle uh, uh, the issue of why concrete pipes were losing market share to uh, plastic and, and other pipe materials uh, due to the fact that uh, by having to put steel reinforcement in the walls, it makes the walls, uh, the concrete pipe real much heavier than they need to be. It adds costs uh, all the way down uh, the, the line and it made them in the smaller diameters uh, uh, fairly non-competitive in the marketplace. Okay. 
So uh, again, this this is the like a, uh, similar to the picture we saw of the pipe flexing in the video. Um, we can make pipes uh, starting at uh, in this technique uh, starting from six inches, uh, 150 millimeters diameter, but with a thickness that's 125th of the ID. Uh, again, we will wrap these in tension, um, and we'll skip the video, uh, Ronaldo, for this. Uh, with FRP, again, the technique we've been talking about. Uh, okay. Um, so again, replacing the concrete element in post compression, imparting this flexural strength in addition to resisting the tensile forces. And the other thing that it provides in a pipe environment here with the wrapping and then the little bit of resin we have is, is it all ends up providing an envelope to protect the pipe. It prevents leakage through the wall, uh, but in addition, it also allows uh, the pipe to be placed in uh, some soil conditions that concrete doesn't work well with, like uh, uh, soils with high sulfate, that kind of environment. Okay. And we've seen this video, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll move on. Uh, Ronaldo, we, yeah. We can skip that video. Oh, these. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, can Mark. Yeah. Can you reach the conclusion, please? Sure. OK. Uh, just a couple of quick points here. Uh, there's a. Um, these are unaffected by fire. Uh, I think I saw some questions popping in about that. We can we can get at those later. Um, and then uh, we want to move on. Uh, Claudio, uh, Ronaldo. Next slide. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll skip this. This is just a cost comparison between the existing RCP. Uh, the catenary poles, uh, we can do these with a uh, uh, either a, a, a total pipes uh, type of situation or a conical ID like most poles are made now. Uh, again, they're going to have long life cycle due to lack of corrosion. We're going to be able to reduce the, the mass of the poles themselves, uh, reduce the cost. And uh, and of course they're going to be electrical conductivity free because uh, there's no steel involved in the picture. Okay, next slide. And railway bridges. This is a future project. We have a couple of projects uh, in structural applications like this. Uh, one going with the uh, uh, Delft University in the Netherlands, and another with uh, with the uh, uh, university in Italy. Uh, working on projects to uh, uh, testing out some of these uh, structural uh, structural member applications for uh, building construction and and other structures like like bridges. Okay, that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention and your time. And uh, we have some time now for questions. Okay, Mark. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, we've got um, several questions here. Um, first, uh, I wish to start from a question by Ross. Uh, he is raising a question about uh, uh, the benefits introduced by this technology in the concrete columns. Uh, typically, in concrete columns, uh, the steel is used uh, to increase um, the compressive strength too. So does this technology, um, can this technology provide benefit uh, for uh, columns too? We haven't researched that directly. Um, I, I can tell you that uh, uh, we have done some work uh, with uh, some pipe producers in Italy producing jacking pipes. And in a jacking pipe, the axial force on the pipe, uh, like the same as what you would get in a in a column if you stood it vertically, uh, uh, if, if by changing the pitch of the winding instead of just being almost entirely circumferential, by, by changing the pitch uh, across the uh, length of the pipe, uh, that increases the axial strength uh, and capacity about uh, 25 to 30%. So 
Um, there's some things that could be done there uh, uh, to to do that, but by uh, uh, increasing that axial capacity or what you would call it, I think what he's referring to is the compressive capacity of the column itself. But we haven't we haven't done columns uh, uh, directly. That's one of the projects that uh, these two universities in Europe are are have started work on is is evaluating the. Uh, the use of this uh, technique in, in uh, structural applications, beams, columns, and floor slabs. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we've got a couple of questions about uh, uh, the effects uh, of uh, damage on the FRP wrap uh, or on the strands. Daniel is asking, uh, something about ballast cutting. So if, these if, sleepers if, are in uh, contact with ballast, so maybe ballast can cut the, the strengths. And uh, there is another question by Dave. Uh, he's asking what happens when uh, some strengths are damaged? Uh, are the remaining strengths uh, overloaded? Uh, so uh, can you give you well, the, uh, I, an answer to this? Yeah. It it uh, uh, you certainly you can you can you can locally damage some you know the exterior do something to uh, scratch it or or maybe damage a few fibers but it's not going to materially change the the performance because the the uh, it isn't the resin that's holding this together you can uh, we've taken pipes and put them into pipe sections and put them into a kiln and burned off all the resin. And brought it out and tested it uh, in the in the uh, uh, in the rack, and it tests exactly the same as as with the resin. It's the 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 action here is the friction between fiber layers when they're when they're wound under this tension, uh, which is creating the post compression. But that's the the strength. The real strength is being achieved by friction and not by the by the resin. And that's why we tension the FRP before wrapping. Is to take the resin out of the structural equation. It's not, it's not taking any load, so you can damage you can damage some section. Now, obviously, if you take a saw and you cut through the whole rail tie or do something like that, yes, that's going to compromise the the performance of it. But the uh, um, uh, a few individual strands is going to change the the performance of this. Also, the uh, wrapping uh, with impregnated with resin is uh, very tough, so is uh, stronger than the concrete. In the the contact with the ballast, uh, the the con consumption comes on the concrete and not in the wrapping, because it's very very tough due to the resin that protect the wrapping. Okay. Thank you very much again. Um, then any, well, some questions about the effect of temperature. Uh, Amelia is asking, um, does temper change, temperature change impact the modulus of elasticity? I not, in not within, to the strands uh, or to the raising. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, let me finish. And uh, okay. the, uh, link it to this, there is another question about thermal expansion. How does the thermal expansion uh, if, um, have effect on the, on the performance of the sleeper? And in particular on the, the, the wrapping itself? Well, the, the... Oh, go ahead, Renaldo. Oh, okay, well, an important point is that the uh, modulo of elasticity of the fiber is uh, low. So any thermal uh, deformation, expansion, reduction of the concrete, for example, does not affect the post compression because the modulo of the elasticity of the fiber is low. So minimum movements does not affect the post compression. This is the main answer. And also these materials, though, uh, especially the, um, the basalt, uh, 
is very strong uh, in I have a strong behavior in high temperature, so it has not uh, it does not change its mechanical properties with the temperatures. We are talking about temperature higher than the current working temperature of the. Okay, um, then uh, I've got a question about uh, the effect of fatigue. Have you got any experience or any analysis about uh, the fatigue on uh, this particular technology? Yes, yes, we have done uh, several uh, fatigue tests and uh, uh, we have not uh, had problem also, again, because of the low module of the elasticity of the fiber, because uh, again, we don't stress them too much due to the low module of uh, elasticity. So this is uh, uh, of help in order to not have fatigue problems. So it's very a good solution also for uh, situation where the fatigue is an, is an important role. Okay. The, the, uh, one, of the, one of the issues you get with pre-stress steel is pre-stress steel is typically stressed uh, before the concrete's cast at a very high percentage of its of its the point where you know it's it's limits it's uh, uh, elastic limit where we are uh, down in the 50 percent range because we're starting with with the material that's already four to as we've mentioned four to six times unit strength uh, higher than what steel is so it's uh, uh, it's, it's just different materials but it, we're, we're we don't have a, uh, an issue with uh, uh, like a, a pre-stress rail ties tend uh, tend to if they crack and they and they get uh, they get over uh, it's pretty easy for them to get overstressed uh, and then and then they've had a permanent deformation in their uh, in their dimension now you've lost your gauge uh, and that's one of the one of the issues with with pre-stress uh, rail ties in high especially heavy freight um, uh, haul situations which is what the what the what the norm is in North America. Um, so that's that comes from just the nature of what you're doing with pre-stressed steel at that high a level, and then uh, and then combining it with concrete. So okay. uh, um, yes, please. Just please one note. point: we use uh, uh, the material in the best their feature. So we the concrete is strong in compression and it is used to manage the compression. The fiber has a, a high tensile capacity and we use it, but in addition to this high tensile capacity, uh, we, it's important that the low elastic modulus, because this low elastic modulus combined with high tensile capacity is perfect for to be used in tension around concrete. So it, they, the benefit of this solution, this, the strength of this solution is that we use the material according to their best feature. We optimize the feature the, of the materials in this way. And this does not happen with concrete and steel because uh, the difference elasticity modulus and, and so on. Okay, then we have uh, a question by Network Rail. The question is written by Darren Sharp and uh, he is asking whether these leapers are compliant with the Network Rail standards. I don't know if you can give an answer about this because uh, on one that, side we have uh, what, in America with what standards? designer on the other side. Uh, as the mentioned standard are the TRK, TRK 030 and TRK 039. But maybe if you can give an answer now, you can get in touch directly with Darren and provide an answer to him, or maybe Darren yeah. can provide the relevant points of the standards to help you. Yeah, but we can have um, a contact to provide uh, with the, general, an answer. the person. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, and we okay. can answer that. 
right? Can more put directly, you but in we contact are... one another. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 For certain, we're going uh, after sorry. the. Um... the uh... Yes, please. Oh, uh, we are going after the North American market because the North American market is a is a heavy freight haul market. Uh, they have heavier loads than what's typical in Europe, and for the and that's some of these issues that we talked about with the pre-stressed ties is why the pre-stressed ties don't have a wide uh, market acceptance in North America. Ninety-seven percent of all ties in the U.S. or uh, Canada are still wood. And um, that's that's why we're going after that the, the, the testing, uh, which uh, you have to pass through. All the railroads are to, uh, in together on this uh, lab, MXV lab in Pueblo, Colorado, and you have to pass through that before and all their tests before you can uh, before they'll like uh, uh, consider uh, putting your the, your ties in the ground and. Uh, uh, I don't know if there's a similar uh, agency in Europe or if it's country by country, uh, but uh, we we have the ability to test, uh, to uh, certainly run tests to to meet the requirements of whatever the local agency um, and demonstrate that it's going to work, um, whatever the local authority is. Uh... Probably the last question uh, is from Hahad. He is asking something about the design life. Have you ever estimated the, the design life of such kind of sleeper? Well, uh, I, I can say that it's probably going to be uh, uh, in excess of 100 years. Um, I can give you an example. The, the Florida Department of Transportation is created a very um, uh, extensive research into pipe materials exposed to different environments. And uh, and they have uh, uh, Florida, of course, is uh, basically a big peninsula surrounded by seawater. And they have, uh, that's where also most of the uh, development and population is. <laughs> and um, in their in their program, uh, non-reinforced concrete pipe, no steel in it, has a 360-year design life in a in a saline environment. Uh, RCP has less than 100. If you put steel in it, now you're down to less than 100. So, steel is the is the problem, uh, uh, you know, in a design life. But that, that non-reinforced concrete pipe in in their system has a 360 year design life, but nobody makes it because there's a big risk factor in producing uh, non-reinforced concrete pipe because it, it, if it develops a crack, it fails very quickly in a hinge failure and it's a dangerous thing to have around uh, on the job site. Nobody will make it uh, uh, for the risk part of the equation. Okay, but we were hoping to change that now with with that with uh, with these uh, FRP pipes, these four CP pipes that we have. Okay, so uh, unfortunately we have uh, no longer time available. Uh, so uh, again, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, thank you very much uh, to all the attendees. I just wish to remind you uh, the next uh, lunch and learn event. Uh, which is set up on September the 26th, so two weeks from now. And the subject is uh, uh, the topic of this event is about geo geofencing. How geofencing is enhancing truck worker safety. So I 